All right, this is chapter 40 of ATI, Endocrine Disorders. We have about eight drugs to go through, and uh, we need to kind of, we're going to kind of review as we go through a little bit some of the stuff, some of the diseases that we're trying to treat. But the endocrine system as a whole, remember, it uh, consists of glands that secrete hormones. So we have these endocrine glands that are kind of scattered throughout the body. Um, and it's primarily controlled, from the brain anyway, by the hypothalamus, which communicates with the pituitary. And then the pituitary will go to like the thyroid gland or down to the adrenal glands and forms that, that, that hypothalamic pituitary axis. And the idea of it is to, to maintain homeostasis using these hormones as chemical messengers. Uh, and then we have this negative feedback. So the thyroid gland produces thyroid hormone and goes back and says, okay, I have enough. And that's that, that negative feedback. And then this comment about one hormone may control another, that's primarily because the hypothalamus will, will secrete releasing hormones and then the pituitary will take that and then release secreting hormones to, uh, to kind of try to complete that, that process. So we have here, so this is the hypothalamus communicating with the pituitary gland, and most of the stuff that we're going to be talking about, the drugs that we're going to be talking about, will affect the adrenal gland, the thyroid gland, and then growth hormone is going to affect muscles. And these are all anterior pituitary. The only posterior pituitary that we'll be talking, hormone that we'll be talking about is antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin, which has an effect on, on the kidneys. Okay. Um, so we're going to start with the thyroid gland. And if you remember, the thyroid gland secretes two thyroid hormones. One is thyroxin and the other is triiodothyronine which is T3, T4 and T3. Now the four designates how many iodine are on there and the three designates how many iodines are on this one. So uh, T3 has three iodines and T4 has four iodines. And the, the, the idea of the iodine is pretty, pretty important because, because it has to put those iodines on there and a lot of the drugs that we have uh, can, can affect that. So I have here follicular cells secrete thyroid hormone, the, the T3, T4. Iodine is essential for synthesis and, uh, and then the negative feedback loop. I also mentioned down here how different cells, called parafollicular cells, in the thyroid will secrete the calcitonin. And remember, we, we talked about calcitonin with the osteoclasts and when we were talking about uh, treating, treating bone disorders. So I, I went ahead and left that in there showing that little axis. So let's start with hypothyroidism, so not making enough, myxedema. And the most common cause of that is autoimmune, Hashimoto's disease, but that's just where you have a decrease in the T3 and T4. So obviously our drug choice, our drug treatment would be something to increase the uh, increase the activity, I guess, but, but in this case, what you're doing is you're replacing it. You're, you're giving something called levothyroxine, which uh, is, is T3 and T4, T4 and T3, but, uh, but that's, that's the idea. And so the, severe, the symptoms of hypothyroidism, weakness, muscle cramps, remember the thyroid gland in general is turning up metabolism. And that's kind of important when we start thinking about adverse effects for these drugs. So, so if the goal of, thy of the thyroid gland is to turn up metabolism, then when it's low, then you're going to have things like when, it's, when you don't have enough thyroid hormone, like the weakness, uh, muscle cramps, not sure how that fits in, dry, dry skin, slurred speech, bradycardia. Uh, you, you tend to gain weight because you're not using that energy and then intolerance to cold. So uh, a patient that's taking maybe something that lowers it, that lowers their thyroid hormone may show some of these side effects or these symptoms. In this case, because, uh, because we're trying to raise it, we, might, we may have the opposite problem. I hope, that, I hope that makes sense. So these are the symptoms of hypothyroidism. Uh, and then, so, so just so you can kind of keep that straight. So when we talk about these adverse effects, they make sense. So now we're going to try to raise it. So we're going to try to increase our T3 and our T4. 
And so we give a synthetic form of that of thyroid hormone. So it's a synthetic T3 and T4 thyroid hormone, levothyroxine, levo meaning elevate or levitate, I guess. Uh, but it mimics the natural thyroid hormones. It increases that metabolic rate, pro which involves protein synthesis, cardiac output. Remember that cardiac component is pretty important. Uh, also, <clears throat> excuse me, renal perfusion, oxygen use, body temperature is can increase, uh, blood volume increases, growth processes overall. So it turns things back up when we're when when they're too low. So the primary therapeutic use uh, replacement for hypothyroidism, and this is kind of kind of important. All ages, all forms. It doesn't really matter if if the thyroid hormones or TSH levels are low. Then then this can kind of kind of increase that and get those get those back up into a normal range. Also used for emergency treatment of myxedema coma, and that's that would be an IV route. Normally this is taken oral. Uh, and myxedema coma is just a severe deficiency of thyroid hormone. So something that where you really need to elevate it quickly. So the adverse effects over medication uh, may result in hyperthyroidism, which we're going to get to. Uh, chronic overtreatment may cause atrial fibrillation, increased risk of fractures from bone loss, especially in older adults. So, so there's that cardiovascular issue and also uh, bone bone loss issues from the from the calcitonin, or from the uh, or maybe from the from the lack of it. I don't know, but either way, you have bone loss, and that's how I make the connection. So you would monitor TSH levels at least once a year to make sure that over medication doesn't happen, because both of these are related to over medication and the range is getting out of out of whack. So you would assess patients' weight, vital signs, tachycardia, all those cardiovascular things, nervousness, weight loss, diarrhea, heat intolerance, all of those. So interactions, uh, the interactions are kind of kind of can be just be grouped into general categories. Uh, if it, if a, if there's a drug that reduces absorption, so uh, certain binding agents, anti-ulcer anti medications, calcium iron supplements, food, all of those things can reduce absorption. Anti-seizure, antidepressant meds can increase the metabolism, so make it make it work more more quickly. Um, or make it break down more quickly. And let's see, levothyroxine can increase anticoagulant effects. So anticoagulant fe effects can also be can also be affected by this. So uh, warfarin, because in specific to warfarin, because it, it breaks down vitamin K and and warfarin blocks vitamin K. All right. Um, yeah, so both things are breaking down vitamin K. So contraindications, precautions, so use is contraindicated following MI. Okay? And that's because thyroid hormone stimulates cardiac function. So, so lay off that, contraindicated. Uh, use caution with other cardiovascular problems like hypertension, angina, ischemia, or ischemic heart disease. And use cautiously in older adults and people with diabetes. And it's not to be used for as a treatment for obesity. So ATI put that in there. And it makes sense because people with hypothyroidism tend to store their energy rather than use it. And people with hyperthyroidism tend to use that energy, which results in weight loss. And so it, I, I think a lot of people would, you know, are, are trying to lose weight. And so it would make sense to take this drug, but you're not supposed to. That's the point. So hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism, most common, is Graves' disease. It's a uh, autoimmune disorder, but instead of blocking, the antibodies actually stimulate high thyroid hormone production. So now we have a really active thyroid gland. So symptoms increase metabolism, tachycardia, the things that we were trying to uh, to happen with the levothyroxine, elevated body temperature, anxiety. And uh, then it can get really bad, thyroid storm. Thyroid storm is just kind of a feedback mechanism where uh, the thyroid hormone kind of builds up on itself and, and uh, kind of gets out of control. So the goal of hyperthyroidism is to lower it. So you would administer thionamides. That's the category. So they're called thionamides, which decrease the activity of the thyroid gland. The prototype drug is propothiouracil, or PTU, and there are some others. So that's one way is to is to actually decrease the 
thyroid hormone. Radioactive iodide is another one that we're gonna, and we have we have protocol or uh, prototype sheets for both of these because this is actually a prototype as well. But radioactive iodide will go in and kill the thyroid cell. So that also is going to be a treatment when your thyroid gland is too active. So the thionamides, did I spell that right? No, I didn't. That should be an I. So uh, that's thionamide. But prototype drug, propyl thiouracil. And it interferes with the synthesis of thyroid hormones. So the synthesis of the T3, T4. It also prevents conversion because T4 is sometimes converted to T3 and T3 is more active. So it blocks that, which keeps the, uh, the T4 levels higher um, and so less active. So primary therapeutic uses, well, Graves' disease. Graves' disease is hyperthyroidism, autoimmune disease. So it's a treatment for that. It also has some other uses, I guess, produces a uh, euthyroid state, so it normalizes your thyroid hormone prior to thyroid removal, um, surgery, adjunct to irradiation of the thyroid gland, so when you, um, so, so it can be used, it can be used for that too, we're going to, we're going to talk about irradiation of it, of the thyroid gland. Emergency treatment for thyrotoxicosis, which is too much excess thyroid hormone, um, so this is an emergency type of treatment when that when it gets really bad very quickly, uh, and then administered to patients with uh, with hyper hyperthyroidism for any reason. Okay, so even if they don't have Graves' disease, if they if they have if they're measured and they have too much thyroid hormone, then this can be used to lower it. So the potential adverse effects it's hypothyroidism. So too much and you're going the wrong way and you go the wrong way too far. So rash, transient leukopenia, leukopenia. Okay, so that's a, a reduction in white blood cells, and that's, that's kind of an important point here. Uh, are the most common side effects, a small percentage can go so low that they develop acranulocytosis, which is a near absence of neutrophils, and then liver injury. Liver injury can also uh, have an effect, or uh, can also take place. So um, Let's see, interactions, uh, anticoagulants can increase the anticoagulant effect, coagulation effects, because it works, I mean, it causes some anticoagulation to begin with, so that can increase that, they kind of add on. Uh, concurrent use of digoxin can increase glycoside levels, monitor and adjust digoxin level if necessary. Okay, so those are, those are interactions. I don't know how important those are. Um, I mean, they're important, obviously, but... Um, Okay, contraindications, precau precautions. So these, these should make some sense. Contraindicated during lactation due to risk of neonatal hypothyroidism. You don't want to pass it on to the, to the little one. And this one, use cautiously in patients with bone marrow depression. That makes sense because it can, in rare cases, lead to agranulocytosis. And so you would use cautiously in people who already had bone marrow depression and or immunosuppression because of those leukocytes and in patients with liver failure. So liver was also was also mentioned as, or liver toxicity or liver damage injury was also listed as a adverse effect. Okay, radioactive iodine. Radioactive iodine, it's pretty cool. Um, turns you into a superhero maybe, but it is, it is radioactive and iodine tends to collect in the thyroid. That's the main place where you're going to find iodine. And so if you take orally iodine, radioactive iodine, then it will collect in the thyroid gland and it can kill cells. So it's gonna, it's gonna kill dividing cells within the thyroid gland and it's gonna shrink the thyroid gland. So mechanism, iodine is used to make thyroid hormone, collects in the thyroid gland, gland. radioactive iodine taken orally can kill actively dividing, everything I just said. So therapeutic use is high doses, hyperthyroidism, so it can kill part of that, shrink it, um, reduce the, uh, the release, therefore. And thyroid cancer, this is a big one for thyroid cancer. And it can be used also for patients who have not responded to other antithyroid treatments, but it's kind of risky, kind of hazardous, so not the preferred way to go. And then kind of a functional use, thyroid function visualization. So the degree of iodine uptake to diagnose thyroid disorders, because you can, when, when you have this radioactive iodine in there, that's something you can view and, 
and get an idea of how the, uh, how the iodine is moving through the body and into the thyroid gland. So potential adverse effects, radiation sickness, bone marrow suppression, these things all make, this, these both make sense anyway because, um, because radiation can kill actively dividing cells, which bone marrow can, can be affected by that if it gets in there. So patient will often need iodine therapy following treatment since the destruction of thyroid tissue may lead to hypothyroidism. So you've destroyed too much is what that's saying. So interactions, uh, other thyroid and other antithyroid medication uh, reduces the uptake. So you would want to discontinue other meds. Obviously, this is going to be pregnancy category risk X. So not to be given because it can damage dividing cells, which is what a fetus is. Contraindicated during lactation as well. And then the fun stuff, maintain a distance of six feet from others, avoid children and pregnant women for one week after administration of radioactive iodine, don't prepare food for others, share reutensils. utensils, uh, the nurse should limit contact with a patient to 30 minutes per day, uh, patients must dispose of waste, it says per protocol, but really the problem is throwing away trash, stuff that has been in contact with the patient or, or maybe with the medication itself or saliva or something uh, can actually set off radiation alarms at waste facilities and uh, avoid coughing, expectoration. So try to, try to keep, that, keep that nasty stuff inside. So iodine products is, a, uh, is another category. So ATI lists strong iodine solutions. Sometimes it's called Lugol, Lugol's iodine, but it's not, this is non-radioactive. And it's kind of it's kind of backwards. This kind of frustrates me because you're giving this strong iodine solution, but what it does is it kind of at the high levels will actually reduce the thyroid's production of iodine, so or of uh, of thyroid hormone. So it decreases that that organic iodine that's being made, and so it, it's going to reduce the function of the of the uh, thyroid gland. So it creates high levels of iodide that will re reduce iodine uptake and inhibit thyroid hormone production. Uh, this always gets me because it seems it seems backwards. You're giving iodine and that's actually reducing the uh, thyroid hormone production. So although iodine is needed for thyroid hormone production, too much actually inhibits hormone production for a short period of time, and that's something else that's kind of important. This is a uh, it only works for a short period of time. So it blocks the release of thyroid hormones into the bloodstream. So therapeutic uses reduce, reduces thyroid gland size prior to thyroid removal surgery, emergency treatment for toxicity or thyrotoxicosis, which is excess thyroid hormone. Uh, and I can't remember what I was going to write there, but I didn't, but I didn't. Oh, it's not used to treat uh, like hyperthyroid. But yeah, it's not used to treat a typical hyperthyroidism. Uh, it's, it's used more in, in specialized uh, situations. Uh, because we have other drugs that treat hyperthyroidism much more effectively. So potential adverse effect, iodism. Corrosive nature of iodine may cause metallic taste, stomatitis, which is in inflammation around your mouth, sore teeth and gums, front, frontal headaches, skin rash. So may progress to overdose, which is severe GI distress, distress and swelling of the glottis or the whole opening where the larynx, where your voice box is. Uh, interactions, concurrent intake of foods high in iodine increases the risk. Yeah, that makes sense. If you're taking iodine orally, uh, strong iodine, then you would want to uh, maybe not get it from other places as well. Potassium sparing diuretics can be affected. Potassium supplements, ACE inhibitors all increase uh, hyperkalemia risk. And it's uh, pregnancy category D, contraindicated for that, but, but I didn't see any other contraindications, at least not in ATI. So anterior pituitary, so uh, I mean, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone is also anterior pituitary, but, but the book kind of separated this out, called it anterior pituitary, but specifically what we're talking about is growth hormone. Okay, so growth hormone in general stimulates growth, so it's a good name. The other word for it is somatotropin, which is something to remember because that's also the name of the drug, the prototype drug. But it stimulates growth, cell reproduction, cell regeneration, stimulates the release of insulin-like like growth factor from the liver, which is going to ultimately cause the growth and build up strengthening of muscles, building up bones, that kind of thing. 
Okay, so under production, so if you don't make enough growth hormone, so it's causing growth. Uh, if you don't make enough growth hormone, uh, then a child, a lot of times these are, these are children, pediatrics we're talking about, may lead to small stature, decreased muscle mass, skin problems. Overproduction of growth hormone may lead to gigantism in children and acromegaly in adults, and this is why Andre the Giant looks like he does because he had acromegaly. He had an overproduction of growth hormone and it caused a skeletal you know, bone reformation, those kinds of things. And uh, gigantism is just getting becoming really, really tall. So if someone doesn't have enough growth hormone, they can be given growth hormone or somatotropin, which is the prototype name. So mechanism, growth hormones stimulate overall growth and production of protein and release, release of free fatty acids. Okay, I think I got that verbatim out of, out of ATI. Uh, Therapeutic use treat pediatric and, a gro and adult growth hormone deficiencies. Really, if there is a deficiency, this, this is growth hormone, so it can turn it up, get it back in a normal level. Uh, examples of diseases, Turner syndrome, Prader-Willi syndrome. Potential adverse effects, hyperglycemia, so increased blood glucose levels, hypercalcuria, -cal which is uh, calcium in the urine, and renal calculi, which are kidney stones. So those, those can also occur. Uh, interactions, glucocorticoids can counteract the effects of growth hormones. So glucocorticoids, they fight so, so they can, uh, so it can counteract those effects. Contraindications, precautions, contraindicated with severe obesity or respiratory impairment. Okay. Um, use cautiously with hypothyroidism because thyroid function may be suppressed. So there were, we're getting into thyroid. Uh, function too, so so it can uh, suppress that. Stop treatment before bone epiphyseal plates close. So, if you're trying to improve growth and lengthening of bones, once those epiphyseal plates that that are on the uh, on the ends of bones, that's where bone growth takes place in this area. Once those seal up, then all you're going to be doing is adding bone where you don't want it. So you would stop treatment before that happens by giving additional. Now, if you have too much growth hormone, so if the patient has too much growth hormone, then you want to reduce it. So the prototype drug to reduce it is octreotide, and it suppresses the release of growth hormone. Okay, um, primary therapeutic use, gigantism in children, acromegaly in adults. I'm, I'm guessing that Andre the Giant was taking octreotide to fix his growth hormone problems. Uh, potential adverse effects, GI disturbances, nausea, cramps, diarrhea, flatulence, hypo or hypoglycemia. Now I'm imagining Andre the Giant with flatulence. So, and also hypo or hyperglycemia. And the funny thing, growth hormone does have an effect on blood glucose levels. Uh, we called for, um, for somatotropin which was increasing it, we said hyperglycemia, but it could also, but it just messes with, with blood glucose. So here it's listed as hypo or hyper, uh, but, but just remember that glucose levels can be, can be affected. Cardiovascular drug interactions may cause uh, conduction delays if used with dysrhythmia drugs. So that's a, uh, that's a caution to watch out for. Okay, now we have another diabetes, but diabetes insipidus. If you remember, diabetes insipidus is, has no effect on glucose. It's not, a, it's not related to type 1 or type 2. Uh, this one is just causing an excess in urine volume. So it's characterized by a production of large amounts of dilute urine. Thirst is increased as a result of fluid loss. So we can see with, uh, and it's related to antidiuretic hormone, vasopressin. And if you're unable to produce enough vasopressin, then you don't put in these little water pores and all of the urine just drains out. So you end up with that really dilute, large volume, lots of urine. And, um, and that's what diabetes insipidus is. So antidiuretic hormone, which is vasopressin, conserves water in the body. That's what's trying to pull it back in. And so if someone has diabetes insipidus, you would want to administer vasopressin or at least something, some kind of an analog of vasopressin. In our case, the prototype drug is actually vasopressin. Uh, desmopressin is actually more common 
It's more commonly prescribed because it doesn't cause as much vasoconstriction that we'll talk about, and it has a longer duration of action. But our prototype is vasopressin, um, which has a shorter duration, usually given via IM, intra intramuscular IV routes. The, the DDAVP, the desmopressin, can be given orally too. So I'm really surprised that that's not the, uh, the prototype. But vasopressin, we already know the name, so we're good there. So antidiuretic hormone, vasopressin, promotes reabsorption of water in the collecting ducts of the kidney, causes, also causes vasoconstriction. Okay, so it is a vasopressor. And uh, desmopressin does not cause that as much vasoconstriction. So primary therapeutic uses to treat diabetes, diabetes insipidus, sometimes, I thought this was interesting, sometimes used during CPR to decrease blood flow to the periphery and increase flow to the brain and to the heart. So uh, I, I guess it's trying to maintain your blood volume by, by not letting, letting the patient urinate out uh, too much. Potential adverse effects, well, you could reabsorb too much water, and then you have water toxicity. So monitor for overhydration, uh, myocardial ischemia because of this vasoconstriction part of the mechanism. Okay, so myocardial ischemia. Interactions, uh, carbamazepine, which is an anti-seizure med, tricyclic antidepressants can increase the action, the antidiuretic action. Alcohol, heparin, lithium, phenytoin can increase antidiuretic effects as well. So we're worried about things that are also going to contribute to that antidiuretic effect. Contraindicated with coronary artery disease. Okay, because it is a vas excuse me, a vasoconstrictor. Um, so contraindicated with coronary artery disease, decreased peripheral circulation, chronic nephritis, uh, because it works in the kidney. So anything that's going to affect blood flow or the kidneys, then you don't want to you don't want to be taking vasopressin uh, if if someone has those those conditions. So using caution in patients with renal impairment, yes, it does work in the kidneys. So that's something to uh, to to monitor. Monitor creatinine clearance makes that kind of makes sense. Now, the adrenal cortex, we, we've kind of been talking about this all semester, and we've been throwing around this word corticosteroids and glucocorticoids. I don't know that we've formally really defined it, um, but the adrenal gland, you know, you have an adrenaline rush, secretes epinephrine, which is also called adrenaline. So adrenaline, or epinephrine, is released from the adrenal cortex. Actually, it's released from the adrenal medulla. But corticosteroids are also released from the adrenal gland. Corticosteroids are the larger uh, classification that includes glucocorticoids, and that's mostly what we've been talking about. We've, we've mostly been using the word glucocorticoids and also mineral corticoids, which includes aldosterone. We've come across that because it causes sodium reabsorption, the RAA system, right? Um, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So glucocorticoids have gluco in the word and so yeah it's just uh, it's just one of the types of uh, of corticosteroids. So glucocorticoids mobilize energy for long-term stress, transfer energy use from processes like bone growth and immune defenses to make readily available energy. So it causes a release of glucose, glucocorticoid. Uh, influence carbohydrate, lipid, and protein metabolism in cells. Uh, and again, that's that activation of energy stores. It's a, it's a stress type of response. Okay. Uh, cortisol is a type of glucocorticoid. So if we have a continuous overactive too much of this release of glucocorticoids or corticosteroids, uh, that's what Cushing syndrome is. Okay. Uh, may be caused by hypersecretion of hormones due to tumors, which is uh, Cushing disease. If it's caused by a tumor, it's Cushing disease. Otherwise, it's Cushing syndrome, which is most of what we've been coming across this semester, is we keep putting out there Cushing syndrome. Well, because it's a side effect of, um, of steroid drugs, because it's activating these, uh, it's activating these, these receptors. So it usually occurs due to long-term drug therapy, Cushing syndrome does. So signs, symptoms, osteoporosis, hypertension, increased risk of infections, delayed wound healing, obesity, redistribution of fat, which is where we get that moon face and the buffalo hump, such fun names, and mood and personality changes. So I put this guy over there that kind of gives a more, more complete list. But that's Cushing syndrome. 
Um, so our pharmacotherapy of adrenal cortical insufficiency, so what if we aren't making enough of these um, of the cortisol or glucocorticoids, if, you're, if your adrenal gland is not working the way that it's supposed to, not making enough, well then you can give a glucocorticoid, which is a corticosteroid. So primary um, insufficiency would be the adrenal, the adrenal gland doesn't produce enough, that's called Addison's disease. Okay, So Addison's disease, you're not making enough. Secondary, uh, the pituitary, there's something wrong in the pituitary. It could be a, a tumor or something up there that's, that's blocking uh, the pituitary from, from releasing its stimulating hormones. So that's secondary. So allergies, neoplasms, wide variety of other conditions can cause can cause it. So Addison's disease is that insufficiency. It tends to be autoimmune, uh, deficiency of both corticosteroids and or glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids. I need to change my wording up there a little bit. So symptoms, nausea, vomiting, lethargy, and they're all listed out here. Low plasma cortisol, high plasma uh, adrenocorticotropin levels because it's trying to get it to work. But anyway, these are the, uh, the symptoms of Addison's disease or an insufficiency. So if we have an insufficiency of corticosteroids, then we can give steroids. We can give hydrocortisone, which is, a, which is in this category of glucocorticoids. So it mimics the effects of natural corticosteroid hormones. Um, primary therapeutic uses, acute and chronic replacement therapy for adrenal cortical insufficiency like Addison's disease, or it could be adrenal crisis. So that was also mentioned, adrenal crisis. She's, she's apparently having that as well, profound fatigue, dehydration, uh, everything just, just kind of magnified in terms of uh, um, insufficiency. Okay, uh, non-endocrine disorders include cancer, inflammation, and allergic reactions. Uh, so we also know that we can give hydrocortisone, we can give these glucocorticoids, gosh, I'm saying that a lot. We can also give this for, to treat inflammation. They're, they're anti-inflammatory. Uh, we know that we can give them for allergic responses. They, they sh shut down that, that uh, allergic and uh, inflammatory process. So potential adverse effects, some of the things that we've been seeing, uh, osteoporosis, adrenal suppression, and so that means you don't want to stop it abruptly. And Cushing syndrome is listed down here, infection, all of these things are kind of related to that. Peptic ulcer, GI discomfort can also be kind of added in that, in that area. But, uh, but yeah, if you have those symptoms of like Addison's or insufficiency and Cushing syndrome, then kind of we're going, going the other direction on that. Now this adrenal suppression, we already know that. We've talked about uh, steroids already, but when, when, you're, um, when you're treating, when you're giving supplemental cortisol, if we say that, then your adrenal gland is gonna kind of stop working. And so you don't want to go off the drug immediately, just quick, you have to taper it. That's kind of the, kind of the important point there. Interactions, NSAIDs, other, other anti-inflammatory, acetaminophen, antipyretic, uh, or alcohol use can increase gastric distress, okay, or a GI bleed. Oral anticoagulants can increase or decrease that, that anticoagulation. Potassium depleting agents can increase potassium loss. Vaccines, toxoids can reduce the antibody response because that's the other thing that um, hydrocortisone does is that, or, or glucocorticoids in general, that stress response does is it shuts down the, um, uh, the immune response. So vaccines and toxoids uh, can, can cause a problem. I, you know, that can, that can kind of interfere. Contraindications, precautions, again, contraindicated in patients with diseases, with pathologies, with viral, bacterial. If they have an infection, then um, that are not, that's supposed to say not controlled by antibiotics. So using caution with recent uh, MI, heart attack, gastro, gastric ulcer, hypertension, kidney disorder, osteoporosis, diabetes, so blood glucose trouble, 
uh, thyroid interferes with that, uh, myasthenia gravis, not sure why that's in there, glaucoma, seizure disorder. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, uh, that you need to, I don't think you have to memorize all of these, but uh, use with caution. Monitor for osteoporosis and elevated serum cholesterol levels. Assess for signs and symptoms of Cushing's disease, because remember you're you're replacing, so you're increasing, which is what Cushing's disease is, or Cushing's syndrome, sorry. Okay, and we got through that. That was the last drug for this chapter.